Thank you for watching Super Cloud 5. I'm Howie Xu, uh, the guest host here. I'm the longtime AI and the data executive at, in Silicon Valley. Uh, this one is actually the third installment I have uh, to talk to generative AI experts. In the first installment, I talked to the AI leaders from Microsoft, Google, Salesforce. In the second installment, just a few minutes ago, I talked to the entrepreneurs, uh, founders, CEOs in this generative AI space. And then this third one, I'm talking to my distinguished panelist, uh, Rob Toes, and uh, he's the partner at Radical Ventures. I'll let him introduce a little bit himself and I brag about what he has done in the generative AI. But, you know, he just recently gave a talk at a TED AI 2023 very impressive one, you know, maybe you should introduce a little bit about yourself first. Absolutely. Uh, well, really great to be here, Howie. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, just a brief background, as you mentioned, I'm a partner at Radical Ventures. I lead the firm's Bay Area office. Um, Radical is a totally AI-focused VC firm. We have close ties with a lot of the world's leading AI researchers like Jeff Hinton and Fei-Fei Li, who's a partner at the fund. Um, we're totally early stage focused. We primarily do seed and series A investments. We occasionally will incubate companies where we bring them together, help them figure out what they want to build and help, help them get launched. We did that with Cohere a few years ago, the large language model company, and, and we've done a couple more incubations since then. Um, and it's been a very exciting time in the world of AI this year, obviously, so I'm looking forward to discussing it with you. So Cohere is one of the large language model players uh, in this space, right? So just a, a week ago, we saw the, you know, some chaos uh, in Silicon Valley, right? You know, uh, the open AI drama or whatnot. Um, so that drama seemed to be actually over, you know, for now. But what do we, you know, as entrepreneur, as sort of the people in this practice, get to learn from this thing, right? You know, can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, it certainly was a dramatic past week or so for everyone. Um, I, I, I guess I would start by saying, as you said, I think the way things ended uh, were a lot less disruptive than it was looking like things might have been. At the end of the day, Sam and Greg returned to OpenAI. Um, you know, the, there will be a reconstituted board, but uh, you know, ultimately, I think not as much changed as was looking like it might. At, you know, over the weekend when Sam and Greg were talking about leaving to do a new startup, and then you know, kind of preliminarily talking about joining Microsoft and having the whole OpenAI team join them. I think one of, if one of those alternate realities had played out, I think it would have totally turned the AI landscape upside down. As things stand, I think things ended up settling in, in you know, a, a, pr a fairly status quo place. So you guys incubated a, you know, OpenAI competitor, if you will, right? But you seem to be relieved to see the outcome. Why? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm relieved. I, I, and I do think, I think there are a few pieces that have meaningfully changed and are, or at least are, are reflections that are worth talking through about it. So I think one is uh, it is incredible uh, to, to Sam and OpenAI's credit that when Sam was fired by the board and it looked like he wasn't going to be able to come back, like nearly every single employee of OpenAI said, that they would rather quit and leave the company than stay without Sam there. So I think, I think that level of loyalty is incredible and speaks volumes about the strength of the organization. And so I think in some ways, OpenAI will be stronger as an organization as a result of this. Um, having said that, I do think um, OpenAI is the go-to provider of choice for a lot of companies that are just starting to ramp up their kind of AI and LLM journeys. And I think a lot of companies um, think about, kind of take the general approach of like, let's start with OpenAI, we'll build an MVP, we'll kind of try it out, it's, it's easy to use, um, it's straightforward, and then as we get further into our journey with language models, we will kind of branch out beyond that and, you know, maybe get an open source model like Llama 2 and fine tune it on our data, or maybe start experimenting with multiple different large language model providers. Um, and I think that's a journey that a lot of companies have already been going through this year. And I do think that this this event, even though it kind of ended up in a in a in a reasonably solid place, like the instability, I think, has opened a lot of people's eyes to like we don't want to be too deeply dependent 
on any one AI provider. And so I do think that, I mean, this has already played out and it's been- So this is a little bit wake up call, right? You know, you're kind of a solely dependent, you are solely dependent on open AI, but now you need to think. Yep. Open model or other models, you, yep. you saw that, right? Yeah, yep, yeah. And, and it, I think it, it is a reality that a lot, hundreds of open AI customers have gone to Anthropic, Cohere, other large language model providers as they start being more thoughtful around like, okay, how do we think about the supply chain of AI for our company? So this is kind of a, whether biased or unbiased, you know, how far away is OpenAI to the rest of the large language model players based on your sort of the understanding? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're obviously, um, you know, an incredible company that's been pushing the boundaries in the, in the field. I think um, the technology moves so quickly that Honestly, I mean, maybe this is a little controversial, but I, I don't think that OpenAI is doing anything fundamentally differently than what other players in the space are doing. And, and not just Cohere, which is in our portfolio, but you know, Reka is another company in our portfolio that's building large language models. There's a handful of other competitors. They all are using the same fundamental architectural approach. And they, you know, at least a small handful of them are staffed by top researchers that have come out of organizations like Google and Facebook and in some cases OpenAI, DeepMind. Um, so I do think OpenAI has, has the biggest team, is the most well-funded, and has done amazing work, but I, but I don't think that there is an insurmountable gap. And I think six months from now, um, I think a lot of companies may end up being closer to them um, than they are now. And I do think like the, the current paradigm that OpenAI and other companies are executing against um, is not going to be the final paradigm for AI. I think there will be new fundamental breakthroughs on the research side. And I think that could shake up kind of the, the landscape and the ecosystem in terms of who the leaders are. So right after the drama closed the last Tuesday, right? This, you know, uh, news about QSTAR surfaced. What's your take on QSTAR? Is that real? Is that something to be, you know, sort of uh, people to pay attention? Or this is some, just the one of the noise out there? I think it's a little overhyped, honestly. Um, I mean, I, I think like OpenAI is working on a lot of next generation research, and I think a lot of it is oriented around how do we get models to reason more robustly, to understand causality, to you know have common sense the way that humans do. And you know, I'm sure I, I, I think what they're doing with QSTAR, I'm sure, is interesting work. It's it's worth noting that like literally nothing specific about what QSTAR was came out other than the fact that it's this new effort underway at OpenAI. And, and just based on the name, there's been so much speculation on Twitter and so forth around what they're working on. Q learning. I, yeah, the combination of Q learning and A-star. I think like people want, like it's, it, 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 it's tempting to have this simplified narrative of like, oh, they, they've figured it all out. They have AGI and it's called QSTAR and like that, that narrative sells, but in reality, I think it's it's one incremental piece of the puzzle that a lot of groups are working on, and and so I, like people, we don't know the details around what the program is, but I, but my expectation is that it's an important piece of research, but there will be many such important pieces of research. Okay, now let's come back to the you know entrepreneur uh, landscape, right? People who are building companies around OpenAI, around the large language models. What do you see, like? Uh, there are lots of them, right? You know, what kind of, you, you are kind of talking to so many of them every day. What kind of traits are you looking for? You know, hey, this is actually worth my investment. Aside from the large language model crew, there will be, you know, half a dozen or a dozen or so. But what about just the, 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 the rest, right? Hundreds, thousands of companies you are seeing. Yep. And, and you mean traits in terms of the founders or in terms of the businesses? Let's talk about both. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a very good. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. So on the founder side, I think it, it does really depend on where in the AI stack they're, they're building. Um, I think for companies that are building foundation models, as you mentioned, whether that's language models or other data modalities, um, the cutting edge research shops really are essential. And it's, you know, it's funny, the entire world is going crazy about AI these days, but there still is a relatively small pool of individuals that really know how to build cutting edge models, you know, less than a thousand probably. And so you want to be backing teams that have those those capabilities and that expertise and there aren't that many of those people out there. Um, you said a four companies, you mean four startups or? For, in terms of the, the number of individuals out there that have the ability to build Got it. Uh, cutting edge models. Um, 
at the application layer, I think the skill set looks very different. Um, companies that are building applications and products on top of other models, whether it's an open source model or open AI's model or someone else, um, I think in that case, much more important than differentiated AI expertise is um, domain expertise and subject matter knowledge. And so just to give a couple examples, like I think there's an interesting crop of companies that are looking to build, and you know, this is very, very relevant for you and Palo Alto Networks, that are looking to build next generation cybersecurity companies that are powered by language models. I think the founder, like the art, the ideal founder for that type of company is not like a hardcore deep mind AI researcher necessarily, so much as someone who's a deep cybersecurity expert and really understands the product needs, the customer needs, what the go-to-market looks like, and the and the marry the data domain knowledge with the large language model. Yeah, right? exactly. How big a deal is the large large language model understanding in that case? I think it still is a, the technology is a big deal. I think it's unlocking possibilities and product offerings that couldn't have existed two years ago. But I think so much of that at this point already you can abstract away as a founding team. So I think you. As an, as an application layer founding team, you need to have competence with large language models, but you don't need to be building your own. And in a lot of cases, like a very good software engineer can learn how to use APIs and RAG and so forth uh, without a lot of previous experience. So I think the, the amount of differentiated AI expertise you need really depends on the kind of AI company you're building. So the people who are able to do deep mind, you know, the open AI sort of the models thing is not crucial in this case. Yeah, yep, yep. For, for companies like you know, building a cyber, LLM powered cybersecurity company or an LLM powered legal company or you know, co-pilot for doctors, something like this, where you're not developing your own models, it's really about the product that you're building and the underlying AI you can kind of take off the shelf and plug and play. So that's the skill set for the entrepreneurs, right? Uh, what about, you know, what do you look for for the company, right, what they do? Because, you know, everyone was telling me that uh, there are 50 companies doing X, 50 companies doing Y. Like, uh, what, are you, what are you doing to sort of, uh, yeah, yep. to, to see, you know, hey, this is what I'm interested in. Yeah, totally. I think the first, and again, you know, we can, we can set aside the sort of the core model builders, which I think is, is a different category, but um, I think... One really important, it sounds simple, but one really important element that we look for is like what the company is doing should be really hard to do. Like it shouldn't be easy and it shouldn't be straightforward and it shouldn't be something that, you know, a few hackers at a hackathon over a couple of days can put together a prototype that kind of approximates. Um, so I, I think that entails a lot of times looking in areas that are less crowded because you're right, there is just this incredible rush of capital flowing into AI startups and AI entrepreneurs popping up left and right, and there are some categories that are very saturated. Um, so I think it is important to think about what are areas that are less targeted, ha have less noise, um, and in large part because they are unintuitive and not necessarily easy to build, but could represent dramatic paradigm shift. And then that's sort of not easy to do. Are you looking, are you looking at the engineering side or are you looking at uh, some deep understanding of the, I don't know, data science or well, what kind of things are you looking for? Yeah, I think it can be either. So the, the cybersecurity example that I gave you, I think is a, is a good one. Like if you think about, you know, you kind of hear the term used sometimes in a derogatory manner, like wrappers around OpenAI or wrappers around an LLM. I think there are some wrapper companies that really are thin, like companies that are, you know, that help you create copy marketing or something like that. That's something that there just isn't a lot of defensibility around because it's easy to build. A cyber, an LLM powered cybersecurity company can also technically be thought of as a wrapper, but it's so much thicker of a wrapper to use the, that parlance. It's, it's so hard to build a cybersecurity product that will get adoption that um, I think that's an example of something that's difficult to build and therefore I can see some breakout winners emerging um, because it's not something that a lot of folks will be able to replicate. Um, another category on this topic of sort of hard to do, another area that we have been spending more time in at Radical is applications of AI in science, in core science. So one kind of probably the most well-trodden subfield of this is applying AI for drug discovery and um, you know, creating new types of molecules that haven't existed before 
and then shepherding them through clinical trials um, and getting them in, in, into market. Um, and that's one area that I think the rise of large language models and generative AI over the past couple of years will be a game changer for drug discovery. But I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of other really fascinating kind of fundamental scientific endeavors that I think can be turbocharged by AI and turned into really exciting commercial opportunities. So AI for material science um, is another example. AI, generative AI for uh, battery chemistry. Um, these are all examples of companies that are very hard to do, require deep subject matter expertise in that particular scientific domain as well as in AI. Um, and as a result, I think are less crowded because just there aren't as many people that are that are going hard after those fields. So you kind of agreed with me that uh, uh, there are areas that are super crowded, yep. but then you're also saying that uh, there are areas not crowded, yep. like uh, the drugs or the battery or those kind of the more fundamental research area that you feel like uh, there should be more generative AI experts in those areas. Yep, yep, definitely. And, and I do think that those fields will begin to attract more and more attention because the markets are massive and the opportunity for value creation is massive. Um, and so I, I do expect them to become more and more prominent and attract a lot more entrepreneurship. So with that, right, you know, there are areas that are super crowded, there are areas not as crowded, right, you know. And then, you know, when I talk to my investor friends or entrepreneur friends, you know, everyone is gung-ho about a generative AI gold rush. Um, what do you think? Is that a bubble or we are not quite bubble? Like, uh, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I love this question. I do think we're in a bubble. Um, I think that there is a lot of irrational exuberance in the world of AI right now. There are deals getting done at valuations that I think don't make sense. I th there are deals getting done that, frankly, I think will look silly in a couple of years. Um, but what I would say is I think the core technology the, the basic insight that the core technology is incredibly powerful and transformative and, and as important a breakthrough as, as the internet or as electricity and so forth, like, I think that is correct. And so I, I would say, I think it's actually inevitable whenever there's a massive technology breakthrough that goes mainstream, it's impossible for there to not be some sort of financial bubble around it because everyone gets excited about it and people's enthusiasm and exuberance kind of runs ahead a little bit of what the technology is capable of. And so I think if you, if you look at prior examples, like the internet is a great recent example. The dot-com boom and bust was, there was obviously a lot of silly behavior, a lot of deals that didn't make sense, people kind of forgot about business fundamentals and a lot of money was lost. But at the same time, like the core enthusiasm for the internet and its potential wasn't misplaced. And in the subsequent 20 to 25 years, we've obviously seen that- It played out. Exactly, well. yeah. So I, so I think both things are true, that we are in a bit of an AI bubble and there's gonna be some deflation of that. But at the same time, five, 10, 20 years from now, it will be the case that this technology is the most important technology of, of our generation. Interesting, so I've been in this business for quite a few years, right? Everyone, every time people ask me, I give the same answer. I said, AI, you know, now of course, generative AI, but even before that, you know, AI is both overhyped and underhyped exactly. at the same time, exactly. all the time. Yep. I think sounds like you see the same thing, right? Exactly. You know, you see the potential being huge, but you know, people are making silly uh, mistakes still. Um, so great. So one last question about enterprise, right? Because I'm an enterprise guy, you know, there, are, there will be consumer-ish uh, kind of the applications, but I care more about the enterprise. So the enterprise, we see that a Microsoft 365 Copilot, you know, went into GA, you know, November 1st. That was probably the first uh, large-scale uh, Copilot um, out there. And then we don't see too many of them in 2023. Right, one year after ChatGPT. Why do you think we are not quite there, you know, a year later? And then what's your sort of the, you know, prediction of the timeline? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a reality, as you said, that enterprise adoption doesn't happen overnight. It moves slowly. And I think this is one reason why expectations and enthusiasm have run a little bit of ahead of reality from a business perspective is that, um, you know, I, th I think by this point, basically every large company, whether it's a tech company or not, has woken up to the fact that generative AI is going to be incredibly transformational and they need to be thinking about AI. They need to have an AI strategy. Every board discussion is around this. You know, every CEO is feeling pressure from the board to 
you know, do something in AI. And so I think basically every enterprise is thinking about it, tinkering with it, doing POCs, playing around with, um, you know, with, with models and so forth. But I think there's still a gap between that and actually figuring out how the technology integrates into companies' operations and products at scale and how you operationalize it, how you systematize it, both on the kind of product side and how it fits into existing product offerings and then also just on the, I guess what you could call the mechanics of it in terms of data security, data privacy, how do we do fine tuning, how do we customize models that work in the way we want them to. And I think that process is underway and is, again, not gonna happen overnight. Like I think a year from now, we, there will be a lot more progress in terms of enterprise adoption, but I think it will be two, three or more years until it's AI is really deployed at scale across the enterprise. So, okay, so two or three years at scale, that's your prediction. If not more, And uh, today yeah. it's more like a tinkering stage, which is very consistent with the previous panel, you know, what the entrepreneurs are saying, right? You know, people are tinkering, we are doing integration, it will take time. Um, last 30 seconds. Uh, so we all have been in this sort of the um, generative AI exuberance stage for the last one year or so. What's one aha moment you had the last one year, or you felt like, wow, you know, I thought things this way, but you know, with now I, I changed my mind. I, I think things very differently. You know, other than things you know, you and I discuss it. Enterprise adoption will always take time. Technology will always be overhyped and underhyped. Is there any one moment in the last, uh, you know, twelve months you describe to me a thing, a moment? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. I think I, I would go back to our earlier conversation around applications of AI in science. And I think what one big aha moment for me, just to give a concrete example, is the ability today for large language models to basically learn the language of proteins, you know, train a large language model, not on English or another natural language, but instead on sequences of amino acids. And the model can essentially learn the language of proteins, the grammar, the semantics of protein sequences, and then create new proteins that have never existed in the world before, have never existed in any organism on Earth, but that are tailor-made to have specific structures and specific functions, and that you can thus kind of craft to be helpful therapeutics for human health and human medicine. I think that idea of using AI for drug discovery, not just to kind of search the existing space of molecules, but to actually create totally new, in this case, proteins or other biological molecules that just have never existed before, but they can serve a certain purpose. I think that really opened my eyes to the fact that I think science in general and, and in particular biology and therapeutics, I think just we're in the very earliest innings of AI completely transforming it. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. You know, the potential of the generative AI is still beyond imagination. That's what you see. Uh, thank you for watching SuperCloud 5. You know, it finished our, you know, I finished uh, talking to both AI leaders of big companies, AI entrepreneurs, founder CEO, and today in this panel, uh, Rob, you know, the representing the investor view. Thank you for watching.